few empires have such a significant reach through history as the glorious Roman Empire. The original Roman Empire, spanning from the fall of the Roman Republic in around 27 BC, lasted as one unit until around the end of the 4th century. Its successors, the Western and Eastern Roman Empires, shared very different fates however. The West fell about as quickly as you can say barbarian, but the Eastern Roman Empire, often just called the Byzantine Empire, lasted until 1453 when Mehmed II led the Ottomans to capture Constantinople, leading to the fall of the Byzantine Empire. Today, even though they've been gone for nearly six centuries, you can still see the influence left behind in the form of religion, with Eastern Orthodoxy being the third largest sect of Christianity, to architecture, with some of Russia's most famous architectural structures being designed directly after the Byzantine style. However, what if these 1,000 years of Byzantine history never existed, and the empire had fallen much longer ago? What if both the western and eastern halves of Rome shared the same fate, and collapsed around the 5th to 6th centuries AD. Well first, let's explore why the Eastern Roman Empire survived for so much longer. While it is true that raiding nomads did damage all across the empire, even in the east, the number of Slavic migrants moving into the east was nowhere near as large as the number of Germanic peoples in the west. Additionally, the Eastern Roman Empire's leadership was much more capable at this period, and experienced much less inner turmoil than their western neighbors. Also, the Eastern Romans were reliably based out of Constantinople, now effectively the center of civilization in Europe. Rome, at this point, was no longer the capital of the Western Roman Empire, but Ravenna was, primarily. Rome kept falling in and out of the West's control until they eventually just gave up entirely. In this timeline, there's a much more massive migration crisis, matching the Western Roman Empire's. The competent leadership the East had dies, leaving rulers either too inept or too young to lead properly, giving little central authority. Slavic raiders roam the countryside, terrorizing the Romans and settling in the Balkans, carving out their own kingdoms. Meanwhile, soldiers are being deployed all over the empire to put down the civil unrest they're suffering from, as more people see the weakening state of the empire as the chance to rise up. Things seem hopeful that they might be able to pull through until, knock knock, it's the Persians. The Sassanid army starts moving west, taking precious land and resources from the already struggling Eastern Roman Empire. With soldiers needed to defend against the Persians and to hold down the uprisings, the nomads invading in the west see an opportunity and move to Constantinople. The Great Walls of Constantinople hold the nomads back, but eventually, due to a lack of soldiers to defend the city and incompetent leadership, the last capital of the Roman Empire falls. From there, it's just cleanup, and what's left of the Eastern Roman Empire explodes into a bunch of different nations formed along various ethnic lines. With the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire, the first question is, what happens to all this land? Such a massive power vacuum would create massive competition. However, one contender would undoubtedly come out on top, the Persians. Unlike in the West, the East did have a major power next to the falling Roman Empire, and they would gobble up as much land as they could hold, moving all the way to the Eastern Mediterranean, and possibly even into Egypt and Anatolia. Beyond them, the other areas would consist of dozens of petty kingdoms fighting each other for dominance, until eventually larger nations come out on top in the areas not swallowed whole by the Sassanid Empire. This begs the first question, what does a stronger Persia mean in this timeline? Well, for starters, it has huge implications on the expansion of religion. Islam, which will be coming around in the next century, would be the biggest loser in this scenario. One of the key reasons the religion of Islam was able to spread so rapidly was because of the state the Middle East was in. The Byzantines and Persians had been fighting for about a century at this point, when Islam showed up in the early to mid 7th century. This allowed the Caliphate to, rather easily and quickly, take land from both the Sassanids and the Byzantines, without a huge fight being put up against them. However, in this timeline, there's only one major power, and the Arab invaders would harass Persia's southern border, but they would not be able to take down the empire like they did in our timeline. Islam may disseminate to other regions, but would largely be relegated to the Arabian Peninsula. The biggest winner here would be Zoroastrianism. Largely forgotten in the modern day, Zoroastrianism is one of the oldest religions in history, and was classically the religion of the various Persian empires, until the tide of Islam came. In this timeline, that doesn't happen, and Zoroastrianism stays the dominant religion of Persia, 
even moving into the Middle Eastern, Anatolian, and North African lands taken by the Sassanids. What about religion in Europe? How would that be different after the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire? The Great Schism between Rome and Constantinople in 1054 was one of the defining points in Christian history, ending the close religious relations between the East and West. Now, there is no strong head of the Eastern portion of the Christian faith, giving the Western portion much more influence. There is no Great Schism, and Catholicism remains a dominant Christian faith throughout the entirety of the continent for many years, instead of just the western half. Additionally, Iberia would never fall to Muslim invaders, meaning there would never be a Reconquista to speak of. This also means that North Africa would likely not become primarily Muslim, but instead would be much more culturally European Christian, because the Vandals and their descendants would be able to stay in power. Also, let's not forget one of the most significant doings of Christian Europe, the Crusades. In our timeline, the Crusades were wars fought by Christian Europeans against, usually, the Muslim Arabs that held the Holy Land, around modern-day Israel. The Byzantine Empire played a huge role in helping with these, and giving them even a chance to succeed, even though they were largely unsuccessful. However, with the much warmer relations between Persia and Europe than what the Arabs had with Europe, the Crusades would not only be impractical militarily, but improbable diplomatically. As for science and knowledge, well, the interesting thing is that it would largely stay the same as it had in our timeline. The Arabs were well known for protecting much of the knowledge that had been learned and created over the many centuries following up to that point. The Persians did the exact same thing, protecting the various mathematics and scientific studies that we consider extremely important to today's teachings. Now we move on to European politics, and how the continent's many kingdoms would have fared after the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire. What this means, short term, is an even harsher Dark Ages, because even if Western Europe and the Eastern Roman Empire had its differences, they did get some support from each other, particularly Western European Christians in the West having a strong friend to the East. Now that simply doesn't exist meaning that trade is even more down than it was in our timeline. However, through necessity for Europe and convenience for Persia, these two begin their own relationship, not unlike the Byzantines with Europe. This makes a huge difference because of one thing, the Silk Road. In our timeline, when the Byzantine Empire fell, the Europeans were effectively cut off from Asian goods that came in through the Silk Road. This is what drove the Portuguese to start exploring for a route to Asia around Africa and then Spain to look for a passage to Asia through the West, ultimately causing the colonization of the Americas, one of the most significant events in human history. In this timeline, there's no reason to look for an alternate route, at least not so soon. If Persia stays in power, which is what we'll assume for the sake of simplicity, there's no reason to be so urgent to find a passage to Asia. This could also mean more trade with West African nations, such as Mali, just as the Muslim empires had done in our timeline also giving less of a reason for such early colonization and exploration. However, even with this delay, European nations would have colonized eventually, due primarily to overpopulation and ambitions, but it would not have been as soon as it was in our timeline. Ultimately, what the collapse of the Eastern Roman Empire means is a stronger Persia, a stronger Catholicism, a weaker Islam, and slower colonization. What do you think would have happened if the Eastern Roman Empire had collapsed? My theory is just one of many, and I want to hear what you guys have to say. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like, it really helps me out. Also, if you're not already, go ahead and subscribe to my channel for more content. Ring the bell next to it to get notifications for my videos, since I don't upload very frequently. If you want to stay up to date with what's going on with me and my channel, you can follow my Twitter. Links to that and my Facebook are down below. Thank you very much for watching, this has been Historical Hindsight and I'll be seeing you soon.